Today we're going to look at an application in vibrations. So what are we going to do? We're going to basically predict the life expectancy of this component right here which consists of a transistor, plastic spacer, and circuit board using hand calculations. So some key terms I'm going to discuss as we go through this are natural frequency, transmissibility, dynamic loads such as D loads, and predicting these cycles until failure or the life of the component. Before we get into the calculations, um, here's the problem we're, we're going to analyze. Determine if a transistor will survive a sinusoidal dwell test, this transistor right here, with a 4G peak sinusoidal input for 30 minutes up to a frequency of 2000 Hz. So um, we're going to do this analytically, but in practice how you would normally do this is you would run a sine sweep test to determine the natural frequency and then you would just once you found that frequency you'd put in a sinusoidal input uh, just put it in and, and observe what the component does uh, run it until it fails so um, because we don't have a shaker or a vibration tool to uh, run this uh, we're going to just do it analytically so you get a feel for what parameters drive uh, the results so now that we have our problem description and a little bit of background on how you can uh, how they do it in the real world um, we're gonna go ahead and step in through it um, some variables uh, parameters that you need to do this analysis is the weight um, which the weight of the transistor is uh, going to be this value the height right I'm calling the height between the circuit board and the spacer to be quarter of an inch the Young's modulus of the wires that are soldered in here and then the diameters of the wire these are just a few of the parameters you need and uh, we're going to be running this test at 4 G's so vibrations can be difficult to understand but if you think of it as in terms of a mass spring damper system it becomes a lot simpler and this is actually the simplest case right here shown in this graphic this is a single degree of freedom system what I mean by single degree of freedom is uh, you only have uh, one coordinate system on one mass and you only have one output in one direction so that's a single degree of freedom system the easiest system you can analyze and you also have uh, the stiffness right here which they, it's similar to a spring constant uh, in series or in, in line with a damping coefficient and so uh, <clears throat> to do this analysis um, there's one key assumption uh, I'm making and that is uh, I'm assuming this circuit board is rigid which means it doesn't deflect and allows us to uh, do this analysis uh, with simple equations if it wasn't rigid uh, coupling effects may come into play but uh, that's uh, for another video So we're going to use this concept right here, this mass spring damper system, single degree of freedom, and we're going to adapt it to our system. So if you look at this, we have a transistor mounted on top of a circuit board with a spacer in between it. So essentially what we have is if we translate it to this form, we have a cantilever beam system right here with three uh, beams. This represents our, our wires and also um, this cantilever beam has an inloaded mass much like this image right here which is going to be the weight of the transistor and also we have a plastic spacer which is going to be part of our damping uh, it's going to go into our damping calculation uh, but if you look at this cantilever beam system it's three cantilever beams in parallel the worst case uh, load on this will be if you shake it laterally so that's what we're showing here uh, we're shaking it not in the X and Y direction I mean the Y direction we're shaking it in the X direction uh, because this will be our worst case uh, you can think of it like an inloaded cantilever beam if that helps you but this is the uh, this is taking this model right here and uh, simplifying it down to this model right here and we'll be able to get uh, you know ballpark results that will help us uh, as an analyst down the road 
So let's go ahead and step into the calculation so we can predict the life expectancy of this system. Uh, the first step is to uh, analyze it as a free vibration case and determine the natural frequency. So free vibration case means that there's no damping. And uh, so if you uh, have a mass on a spring and you uh, just give it an impulse and let it uh, oscillate up and down, it'll oscillate at a natural frequency. Um, and uh, that's what we're trying to calculate here. So step one, calculate the natural frequency, and it's going to be a function of our uh, spring constant or stiffness. And um, so the, uh, this kind of goes through the mathematical labor of doing it. Don't get caught up into it too much, but I calculated a moment of inertia of one um, wire. So this is a circular wire. And then um, because uh, we need to determine stiffness, we treat these as springs, three springs in parallel, and um, you can do that calculation, but basically the effective stiffness right here is going to be the sum of the stiffnesses of each of these rods. So the stiffness of a cantilever beam in the uh, in the this direction, the lateral deflection direction, basically an end loaded cantilever beam is going to be three times Young's modulus times the moment of inertia divided by the length cubed and because we have three of these we have to multiply it by three and uh, we get an effective stiffness right there and then uh, because we're analyzing this as a single degree of freedom system uh, they have an equation to calculate the natural frequency and it's simply going to be this equation right here 1 over 2 pi times the square root of the stiffness over the mass of this end mass right here and uh, this kind of goes through those details um, we converted the uh, the weight to a mass by dividing by the acceleration due to gravity <clears throat> and you uh, get 405 Hertz so step two we've determined the natural frequency so the natural frequency goes into our force vibration calculation so when we say force vibration we're actually putting an input force uh, going left and right. It's no longer an impulse and let it do its thing. Uh, we're putting in an oscillating force here and it's going to um, affect uh, the force output on this mass. And so there's some key things you need to uh, think about when you think of force vibration. You need to think of damping. So damping comes into play during force vibration which basically is uh, going to be our plastic spacer. It's going to absorb some of that energy because the beam these rods are going to actually hit that plastic spacer and that plastic spacer is going to absorb some of that energy and also um, you need to think of an amplification factor so when you put in an input uh, in vibrations it's going to get amplified um, as the force moves up um, and so uh, basically you're gonna have to use a table or equation to calculate that and uh, so the energy you can think of an amplifica amplification factor as energy being transferred from the base up to the end load, um, and the worst case occurs when the input uh, force frequency matches the natural frequency of the system, and we'll see that here in a second. So this is a chart of transmissibility as a function of the frequency ratio and some key observations here is to observe that you have several different curves and it's actually a function of damping so if you have no damping you're going to have a high amplification factor if you have more damping you're going to see this curve shrink down and if you're critically damped uh, you basically don't have uh, your force isn't amplified and uh, some other key notes is the transmissibility is going to be a function of the input natural frequency right here. It's going to be a function of the input natural frequency over the natural frequency of the system. So when they are equivalent, you have resonance. Uh, and that's where your worst case occurs on all of these curves is at resonant condition. So that's the condition we're going to look at today because that's the worst case and as a designer you always want to design for the worst case and so to do this calculation first we need our natural frequency which we calculated previously 
and then we need to determine our transmissibility. You can do it from the curves, but there's a convenient relation for electronic circuit boards that the transmissibility is going to be proportional to two times the square root of the natural frequency that we calculated in step one. And because we have a plastic spacer in between, we're going to have some damping. And so I'm just going to go ahead and say that it's going to remove 50% uh, of uh, the energy that uh, amplifies our force output. That's an assumption. So if you do that, um, your uh, amplification factor comes out to 20. So essentially any load you put in here is going to be amplified by 20 at the very top. So after we've completed steps two, we can determine our dynamic loads and stress. And so what are we talking about? This takes into account G loads, transmissibility, and also um, stiffness is going to uh, be a uh, factor in, in the dynamic loads. So we can see here we have a uh, the input creates a dynamic load at the end, and it's a dynamic point load. So to calculate the uh, the load at, at on the mass here at the end, it's going to be the weight of this um, unloaded mass times the g load. So we're using 4g sinusoidal input times the amplification factor or transmissibility, and so you get a value of this right here. And once you've determined that dynamic load, you actually want to go analyze one of these rods. And so you're going to look at, um, you can do free body diagrams, uh, but you can see that this is going to be a uh, indeterminate system. It's easier in this case to apply the stiffness method to transfer this dynamic load to each of the wire loads, to each of the wires. And so that's what I'm applying here. Uh, simply the sum of the forces uh, equals our dynamic load and also we know because um, these wires are in parallel that their deflection if you move this mass back and forth they're going to deflect the same amount that means that they're um, uh, also uh, the stiffnesses of each of these rods since they have the same moment of inertia they're the same size same material they're going to be equivalent to each other and using the definition of stiffness here, you can essentially uh, show that the forces transferred to each of these rods are going to be the same value. And so we take these, this equation right here, we plug it back into here, and we simply get the dynamic load is equal to three times the force on the wire. And um, if you uh, take that dynamic load right here, divide it by three, you get your end load on each of these wires. So that was a lot of mathematical labor, but the point is, is we apply the stiffness method to transfer the loads uh, to the wires. And now that we've done that, we can look at one wire, one free body diagram right here, and we can determine our reaction loads. In this case, the dynamic moment uh, occurring at the base We've all done this before. Um, this is just simple cantilever beam calculations. And then once I've determined the dynamic moment due to the uh, force due to the on the wire from the dynamic load, we can calculate a stress using our uh, stress equation for bending. And um, I'll let you guys work through that. You get a value of uh, basically 36,500 PSI as the worst case stress on this wire. Now, once we have the worst case stress in step three, we can go ahead and determine the cycles until failure. So this is an SN curve, S meaning stress on the Y axis, N meaning the number of cycles on the X axis. And you can see this, you're gonna usually be able to formulate this graph. Um, here I'm giving it to you. But we, what we want to do is we want to determine in sub 1 here our cycles until failure. Um, so this occurs at uh, our highest, our worst case stress value of 36,500. So to do that, um, this kind of goes through the mathematical stuff. Uh, you want to determine the slope of this line. And uh, because we have a log log scale, we just uh, calculate the slope uh, with, with uh, 
like we do linearly but we just put a log in front of it the values and then after that we can determine our cycles until failure using this equation right here this can be derived um, I'm just giving it to you um, but basically we're calculating n sub 1 knowing a point another point on this line in this case we're taking this point right here is, is our uh, sigma 2 and, and n sub 2 and we can calculate the number of cycles until failure from an SN curve so that's basically the summary we get our number of cycles and then we can determine life by using our natural frequency which we calculated to be 405 Hertz we convert that to convenient units um, to minutes and uh, so the life turns out to be 8.7 minutes that's the predicted life for this component so analytically this this transistor will not survive uh, under the uh, given circumstances now that we've calculated a life and realized our component most likely won't survive the test um, what are ways we could fix the situation? Um, number one, you could increase the natural frequency of the transistor above the 2000 Hertz range. Because our testing environment takes place up to 2000 Hertz, uh, if, theoretically, if we increased our natural frequency of our component above that, that 2000 Hertz uh, level, then essentially vibration wouldn't be a failure mode. Um, so what are ways you could do that? You could increase the stiffness of the uh, the system by decreasing the height of the transistor. Uh, we saw in a, an equation to calculate stiffness that uh, it's proportional to the length of the wires. So if we decrease the length, we would increase the stiffness uh, of the system, the equivalent stiffness. And also, you could increase the stiffness of the transistor wires by also, you know, cementing the, them together. Um, that would increase the the stiffness of the transistor body. So another way besides changing the stiffness would be to uh, decrease the transmissibility factor. So how could you do that? You could add uh, silicone or RTV inside that plastic tube that encloses the three wires. That way when this thing starts to vibrate, more energy gets dissipated by the, um, the uh, plastic and uh, fluid, viscous fluid, and your transmissibility would in turn decrease. So the key points I want to uh, address here is that uh, decreasing the transmissibility factor means increasing the damping coefficient, which is related to energy dissipation, and all this does is uh, reduce the dynamic stresses, whereas stiffness uh, manipulates the natural frequency. And so those are the two key uh, uh, points that the, the two key takeaways that I'd like you to go away with. And so we've we've kind of went through this process of uh, taking a uh, a real life system and uh, basically using a uh, convenient model to model it, and then using analytical calculations to determine natural frequency, transmissibility, and also uh, you know dynamic stresses and determine the life of the component so this is a summary of what we did uh, right here you can pause the video and read these but this is kind of how you would approach a vibration problem and uh, I highly suggest if you're a structural analyst you actually go through this because you'll learn a lot about vibrations and uh, it's just good to, to know as an engineer so guys I hope you enjoyed the video I know it was long but I think it was time well spent and uh, I'll see you next time adios